All right, so uh, for the next 15 minutes, I'll be talking about perioperative pathways uh, used in bladder cancer, pretty much predominantly talking about EBRAS pathways, enhanced recovery after surgery pathways. Uh, I have no relevant disclosures to this topic. Uh, so the objectives of this talk, you know, number one, I want to uh, understand the rationale uh, behind the ERAS pathways. Two, define the distinct uh, perioperative periods where ERAS pathways may improve overall patient care. And number three, evaluate the efficacy, looking at some data with each of the, within the, each of these time periods. So first, I'd start, we'll start out with some of the basics behind ERAS. Um, so enhanced recovery after surgery, how did it all start? Well, in the, in the 90s, um, there's a paper published by uh, Kelhet, and he really introduced the concept of fast-track surgery. And the, the purpose was to standardize pathways so that we reduce stress, maintain uh, post-op physiology, and enhance mobilization. All these factors uh, really coming together to reduce patient anxiety, get patients out of the hospital quicker. Um, they wanted to do it using evidence-based uh, pathways and also using a multidisciplinary approach because prior to this, everything was pretty much based off how you trained and I do this because that's how I was trained and that's, who, you know, and they do it because they were trained that way. And so I think it was a push to kind of really get some evidence behind what we do with surgery. Um, it started with the ERAS uh, study group. Now they renamed themselves to the ERAS Society. And really, the colorectal surgeons were the first to really push this. And in 2005, they released um, the first ERAS protocol for colorectal surgery. Since then, in uh, 2013, uh, uro urology had, had their first ERAS pathway with cystectomy. Um, so how does that work? You really need to have a team to do an ERAS pathway. It's not just a one-person show. It's not just the surgeon heading it all up. You have to have a team, and you have to have buy-in from multiple, multiple people. And so that involves anesthetists, nurses on the floor, nurses in the recovery area, physical therapists, stomal therapists, dietitians. And I think the most important thing is getting the patient and the patient's family involved uh, with all of this. And so this is from the ERAS Society. You can see that there's lots and lots of components to it. It's not just one piece that does it all. There's no silver bullet in any of this, but it's a combination of things involved in the preoperative, interoperative, and postoperative pathway that really uh, make up ERAS. And so if you look at it, you know, I think there's three distinct periods. One's the preoperative period, one, the, other, the next is the operative period, uh, really dictated by the anesthesiologist, I think, and the postoperative period, which is something that we as surgeons can really help, help try to optimize. And so what I wanted to do next is really focus on some of the evidence behind each of these uh, different areas. It's a little challenging because there's so many components to these ERAS pathways. Some of them can have 20 different pieces to them. And if you say, well, identify one of them and how does that one impact everything, it's really hard to parse it out because you're really looking at the whole picture. And so oftentimes when they're bundled together like that, it's really hard to really focus on one. But I think uh, some of the evidence here really does, talk, uh, does speak to some of that. Here's that uh, paper that was published by the ERAS Society in Clinical Nutrition. It was in 2013. They came up with 22 uh, distinct elements to, to compromise the radical cystectomy ERAS protocol. Now, at this, at this time, there wasn't a lot really published specifically with cystectomy, so a lot of it is, was derived from the colorectal literature and the general surgery literature. Um, but I would first like to talk about the preoperative uh, area, and so I think that's something that's often overlooked and it's really hard to study is preoperative cystectomy counseling because I think the patients come into it and they say, I'm going to get my bladder out and you're going to get a bag and you go home. You know, patients don't really understand what really happens. And I think the more they understand, you really set their expectation on what's going to happen. Um, and it really can reduce their anxiety and give them a goal uh, on what to do. For instance, I had a patient that I told him we're not going to do any narcotics postoperatively. And he freaked out initially, but then I told him why. And, and after he understood, I think he bought into it more, and he's really trying hard not to use narcotics um, to help with his uh, bowel recovery. Bowel prep is always a kind of controversial thing. When I was a resident, we used to run around and look up the nickel prep, and I still can't really remember what it is, but we'd look it up every time, and that's what we gave to everybody, and we would give them varying amounts of NPO and, and various bowel preps, and so I think that since that time, um, there's been a lot of work with looking at bowel preps. And so a few studies i like to highlight. One looked at 62 patients looking at a three-day bowel prep versus NPO eight hours um, prior without bowel prep and really found no difference in morbidity or length of stay. Another study looking at 86 patients uh, that had standard bowel prep versus none, really no difference in the frequency of complications and patient recovery. And so 
based off these and the, uh, the amount of prior colorectal surgery literature there they had, the ERAS recommendations for cystectomy were you can safely omit preoperative uh, bowel preps. Oftentimes, that does lead to uh, fluid, um, fluid issues with the patients because they come in dehydrated to the OR and then you end up giving them extra fluid and it just, they get extra fluid for the, for the case. Uh, what about preoperative fasting? I think a common thing is you should be NPOF for midnight six to eight hours before because we're fearful that you will vomit and aspirate gastric contents. And so uh, a Cochrane review looked at this, uh, they looked at 22 randomized trials and really found no difference in the gastric volume or the pH in patients who um, had prolonged NPO versus those that had NPO two hours prior. There's no increased risk of aspiration or uh, pneumonia. And actually, patients didn't come in with, uh, you know, preoperative hypoglycemia and insulin resistance, so they actually had better outcomes. And so the, re the recommendation is uh, you can have clear liquids uh, two hours prior to the induction of general anesthesia, and solids are allowed up to six hours, and that's, that's based off, um, based off of, again, some colorectal literature. What about carb loading? Um, so if you're NPO for so long, then you don't have any sugar in your body, so you break down glycogen stores from your liver, you have gluconeogenesis, and then you end up having uh, kind of worsening insulin resistance, which has been associated with worse outcomes. Surgery causes insulin resistance. The more aggressive the surgery, the more insulin resistance you have. And so the thought was, well, what if you give people some sugar or some carbohydrates before surgery? And they looked at a meta-analysis of um, uh, looking at 21 randomized studies. In total, they had about 733 that got carb loading, 950 did not. And there's really no difference in the length of stay. Uh, if you looked at the subgroup analyses and, and the patients that had carb loading before major abdominal surgery, you actually had a one day lower length of stay. Um, uh, reported aspiration pneumonitis wasn't any different. There's no increase in complication, but there was a reduction in the insulin resistance and insulin related complications. And so because of this, uh, the ERAS Society has recommended preoperative oral carbohydrate loading uh, in non-diabetic patients. And so what we usually tell patients is we give them a, a boost breeze shake and we tell them to drink it on their car ride in. So by the time they get to anesthesia, it's been about two hours. Um, what about DVT or thromboembolic uh, prophylaxis? Certainly I think everyone agrees that it is beneficial to do it uh, while they're in the hospital. Uh, so during that uh, inpatient stay, but um, extending it on four weeks after surgery has been shown to be beneficial. Here's a study from University of Chicago where they had patients that were just getting um, anticoagulation prophylactically during the inpatient stay and compared them to eight weeks, excuse me, four weeks of uh, extended VTE prophylaxis and there was a reduction from 12% um, to 5% of VTE events. And so, um, a recommendation by ERAS Society is you know, consider extended prophylaxis at four weeks after surgery um, for these patients. What about operatively? I think intraop is, is uh, tough to study because every anesthesiologist has a different algorithm and a different, different uh, way they trained. And so I think that standardizing the protocol that you give the patients can help. You want to avoid long-acting opioids, which again will reduce uh, your bowel recovery. Uh, we give magnesium, ketamine, ibuprofen uh, in order to uh, minimize that. The ERAS Society certainly uh, gives strong evidence to have a standard protocol. Now, which protocol is the best? No one really knows. I don't think there's any evidence for that. Um, again, to further augment um, the non-opioids uh, given during uh, the, the anesthetic portion of the case, you can also consider tap blocks or uh, epidural catheters, I think. I don't think one is better than the others. They have pros and cons. Epidural catheters tie the patient to the pole. Sometimes they're less likely to mobilize and walk because of it. But again, all of this is to reduce uh, post-op op opioid requirements. Uh, another big area intraoperatively is goal-directed fluid therapy. I think there's a challenge uh, during surgery to maintain uh, physiologic fluid status in these patients. They're losing blood, they're getting anesthetics, their pressures are shifting. Um, Sometimes they come in dehydrated into surgery because they haven't drank or eaten or they have a bowel prep. And so it's really hard to gauge what their fluid status is. And then you clip the ureters or you cut the ureters and you have no idea what the urine output is during the case. And so the solution to hypotension is just give them more fluids, which certainly will um, certainly doesn't help ileus. And so uh, a couple groups have looked at, look at looking at transesophageal Doppler. They basically put a Doppler in uh, 
um, look at the stroke volume, make calculations based off stroke volume on what the patient's fluid status is, and give them appropriate fluid based off that, given the fact that you don't really know what the fluid status is during cystectomies. Shown to have improved uh, ileus flatus, bowel passage, lower nausea, vomiting, and lower infection rates. Another thing that uh, another group of studies is giving continuous uh, norepinephrine and uh, fluid uh, restriction during the case um, versus standard hydration. So the, so the goal is to not give extra fluid, but to you know, give them a little presser. And they noted that the patients had lower blood loss and transfusion rates with that. So again, something that the anesthesiologist and, and the surgeons can certainly work with, but it's always a challenge to figure out the right amount of fluid to give these patients. In the post-operative period, um, I think it's pretty generally accepted that uh, you should remove an NG tube after surgery. Um, 37 uh, prospective trials looked at early NG tube removal versus delayed in a Cochrane uh, database collaboration in patients getting open surgery. And they noted that patients that did not have an NG tube had a shorter time to flatus, fewer pulmonary complications, a shorter length of stay and less vomiting really without any difference in wound infection rates, anastomotic leaks, or in incisional hernia rates. And so I think it's pretty well accepted that um, no NG tube is the way to go after the surgery is done. Uh, chewing gum is, has been shown in uh, a couple series, looking at with 162 patients, uh, that if you chew gum, you had shorter time to flatus and, uh, and first bowel movement with really no difference. There's not much morbidity in, in, that you can get from chewing gum. Um, Alvimapan has been well studied. Uh, it's a mu opioid antagonist, so it, it blocks the peripheral effects of the opioids, namely on your gut, and it's been shown to have uh, improved um, length of stay. This is a study done by Cheryl Lee looking at uh, alvimapan in the cystectomy population with a reduction of about two days in the length of stay. It's also been shown to be cost effective, although it is expensive for the drug. It's $882. It does translate to uh, a reduction in overall length of stay cost and also ileus related costs from about to $22 to $2,300 there. Early feeding has always been controversial. When do you feed patients? Do you wait till they have a you know, bowel movement? Do you wait a day or two? Really no specific urologic literature addresses this one issue. The concern is, is that if you feed someone too early, their anastomosis may you know, break open and leak or they might throw up because they're just not ready yet. And so. ERAS Society recommends early oral nutrition four hours after surgery. Um, there was a Cochrane review of this looking at 17 randomized trials. Um, in GI surgery, distal to the ligament of trites, so small bowel and large bowel surgery, excluding the duodenum. And they found that early feeding resulted in a shorter length of stay, reduction of, uh, in the complication rate without really any increase in anastomotic leaks. Obviously, you have to you know, play this um, uh, by looking at the patient's amount of distension, and, and it's you got to play it by ear sometimes, but certainly there is some benefit to early feeding. And so, if you put it all together, you really need a team effort to do this. You got to have buy-in from everybody. If you tell your your patient to drink two hours before surgery and anesthesia doesn't agree, they'll cancel the case, right? So you have to really get everyone on board. It can be quite challenging, and really to educate everyone on on what your goals are um, is paramount. And I think there's no one standard way. You can't just pick up one ERAS protocol and plug it into your institution because every, every place is different. They've got a different culture, different cost, different access to various things. And so I think it's definitely a work in progress. Here's an example of something we have at OU, uh, various uh, diagrams. And we, we put this up in the pre-op office and also in the, um, uh, the PACU just to, so that the nurses and everyone understand what the goal is and what the different components are. If you look at the evidence, there's numerous trials that are out there looking at various uh, sample sizes and various elements. I think one of the biggest series, um, most salient ones, is the USC experience. They had 145 patients that they, with ERAS, and they compared to 144 pre-ERAS. And they basically have the same pre-operative, operative, and post-op management. They don't use an epidural. They interestingly use uh, oral neostigmine to help jumpstart the bowel. And they noted that there was, uh, if you look here, the red is ERAS, shorter time to first flatus, shorter time to first bowel movement, and a shorter uh, length of stay with that. And then last thing I want to really mention is auditing your protocol um, uh, is helpful. You don't know if everyone's, if everyone's in full compliance with it, and you also want to make adjustments as you go. You won't really know where you're at unless you compare it to your baseline. And so 
This is a uh, study from the UK that, lo that looked at their pre-ERAS and ERAS uh, version one, and then they compared it to their version two. By making incremental changes to the protocol, they, they did get some marginal results, lower length of stay, and a shorter time to flatus. So just to wrap everything up here, ERAS protocols have been shown to improve perioperative outcomes without increase in complications. This may translate to better um, improvement in overall cost. I think continued refinement of these pathways certainly will help optimize the pathway and auditing them is, is certainly essential. And I think it's a team commitment and that's totally, that's really real, is, is one of the main factors that will um, uh, be a part of the success of the program. Thank you very much.